Hi everyone! Welcome to TEDx Youth at Torrey Avenue 2020. My name is Kelly Tung and I am the chair of the Cupertino Teen Commission. Hi, my name is Rishti Adesera and I am a member of the Cupertino Library's Teen Advisory Board. First, we'd like to play a short video to give you an introduction of what TEDx has to offer. From Kenya to Colombia, from Iraq to Korea, in slums, in schools, in prisons, and in theaters. Every day, people gather at TEDx events around the world to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. Today, you are part of a global conversation about our shared future. So what is this TEDx? TEDx is an initiative of the TED Conference, a nonprofit devoted to ideas worth spreading. We grant free licenses to allow TED-like events to spread globally. This event today is based on the TED conference format and ideals, but is independently organized by your local community. So please make sure to thank the team of volunteers who worked so hard on today's event. It's their ideas, dedication, and time that made it all possible. It's they who booked all the speakers, and the views you'll hear today are, of course, those of those speakers, not necessarily of TEDs. But we hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you'll take out. And now, on with the show. We are honored to be your MCs for today and thrilled to see the Teen Commission collaborate with the Teen Advisory Board on this event. Thank you for tuning in to our live broadcast. We are so excited to have our speakers share their talks with you all. We also want to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, who are the City of Cupertino, Friends of the Cupertino Library, and the Santa Clara County Library District. Our theme for this year is Ignite. We have several talented individuals who are so excited to share their talks with all of you. With their enthusiasm and passion, they are ready to advocate for their perspective on the theme, Ignite. Let's take a moment to think about the word Ignite. Most of us will think of fire or flames. Similarly, the goal for our theme this year is to ignite the flame within all of us, to overcome challenges and bring innovation to a whole new level. We want to inspire and fire up the innovation, creativity, and passion in you. We have the power to change the world. Igniting what you believe is true within yourself is the first step to making a positive impact on the society around you. Our speakers today are going to ignite their light within their speeches, and we hope that we can inspire and motivate all of you. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce the mayor of Cupertino as our first guest speaker. Mayor Stephen Scharf has made a huge impact on the community by serving as a responsible leader and role model. He advocates for schools, smart cities, transportation, sensible growth, and the environment. Today, Mayor Scharf will be talking about the ingenuity of teens and the importance of inspiration in sharing ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mayor Stephen Scharf. Hello, I'm Stephen Scharf, Mayor of the City of Cupertino. I'd like to begin by thanking the Cupertino Teen Commission and the Cupertino Library for working together during this time of uncertainty to bring you this event. Their dedication, along with the passion of our speakers, serves as an example of perseverance in these trying times. This year's theme, selected by our teens, is Ignite. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a lasting impact on all of us, but the innovation of our young adults continues to shine bright, and their well of creativity sparks novel ideas. Today, you will hear topics ranging from cultural awareness to the effects of technology and the competitive Silicon Valley spirit on our youth. I hope our teams will ignite a shared desire among us to continue supporting each other, not only during this time of crisis, 
but also for inspiring a new tomorrow for generations to come. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you so much, Mayor Sharf, for that wonderful talk. Our next speaker is Ms. Jennifer Weeks. She serves as the acting county librarian for the Santa Clara County Library District. She is an amazing leader and is an inspiration to so many people due to her energy and positivity. She is devoted to introducing people of all ages to the joys of lifelong learning, reading, and the library. Please welcome Ms. Jennifer Weeks. Hello, and welcome to the 2020 TEDx Youth at Torrey Avenue event. My name is Jennifer Weeks, and I am the County Librarian for the Santa Clara County Library District. Last time, this exciting event was held in person at our Cupertino Library. But this year, well, we're taking advantage of that T in TED, our technology. The library is a place that welcomes all and provides the inspiration and resources to explore and learn. For teens especially, the library is all about access to information for school, for fun, and most importantly, for discovering more about who you want to be. Yes, we still have books, of course. Plus, our library is a virtual space you can access 24-7 with contests, ebooks, and streaming music and movies to name just a few of the amazing free resources the library district offers. So yes, this TEDx event is a bit different this year but it's still about sharing great ideas, ideas from smart and creative teens right here in our community, ideas that inspire and connect us. Today, we're going to hear about ideas from these incredible teens who wanna share these ideas to make our world a bit brighter and better. And right now, we can certainly use that. So although the coronavirus has reshaped the way we have to meet, Thanks to the cooperative efforts of the Cupertino Teen Commission and the Cupertino Library Teen Advisory Board, TEDx Youth has gone virtual. Thank you for joining us and be well. Thank you for the inspiring words, Ms. Weeks. Our final guest speaker for today is Isha Ram Kumar. As a veteran TEDx speaker, Isha had the opportunity to present her ideas and reach out to the entire community. Today, Isha will be sharing her own story to show the impact that TEDx has made on the community. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Isha Ram Kumar. Inspiration. Inspiration is a really powerful word because even just moments of inspiration can do so much. They can build buildings, fight injustices, and lead on communities to achieve more and care for one another. Today's TEDx event gives us that platform to feel inspired and to inspire others. I remember the first time I watched a TED Talk. I had just turned 10 sitting in my fifth grade classroom when my teacher said he would be projecting a short movie onto the screen. I didn't think much of it at first. It was by a man named Dan Pink, and despite what should have been obvious, he wasn't wearing a pink shirt. But over the course of those 15 minutes, I began to learn about newer insights, claims I hadn't heard before. But more importantly, I was inspired by Dan Pink's ideas. Dan Pink talked to us about the puzzle of motivation. What motivates us? And while I thought that answer was simple, was it money, rewards, incentives? He managed to entirely deconstruct what I believed were norms, reassemble them, and left my entire fifth grade classroom in awe in 15 minutes. Dan Pink's moving talk inspired me to dive deeper into the TEDx community as I explored more stories, solutions, and life-changing phenomena. Last year as a speaker myself, I had the chance to share my insights with my community through my TEDx talk. I had built an app for individuals with autism, helping them ease some of the challenges they faced on a daily basis. Through my TEDx journey, I was able to reach those boys and girls who wanted to be a part of that process, building, creating, developing, and giving back to the community. With their help, 
we were able to reach so many more individuals with autism and foster a much greater impact. Communities are vital ingredients in our society. They need us, we need them, and together that forms a support system. Today's TEDx event is special not just because it's a TEDx event, but one inspired by the community. The Cupertino Library is one of the only libraries that have taken great initiative with the high school students. And together, they have resolved to give this innovative platform to the young speakers. The Cupertino community, made up of the parents, the children, the teachers, the librarians, and the organizers, are what form the basis of support here. So even though the world is currently facing some unexpected detrimental obstacles. Today's speakers have gathered together and decided to take action as a community. The topics they speak about evoke utter determination, perseverance, and grit towards solving. So let's come together today as a community to inspire and support each other. Thank you for that motivational talk, Isha. Today's speakers have all found ways to ignite their passions and dreams within their speeches. From the dual aspect of culture to the Silicon Valley bubble, they are all inspirational teens who will not let obstacles stand in their way. We hope that listening to their speeches will motivate and inspire all of you. Our first speaker for today is Neha Washikar. Neha is deeply immersed in Indian culture. She speaks two Indian languages and practices Indian classical dance. By sharing her experience as a bicultural person, Neha will be teaching us about the significance of biculturalism and how we can develop cultural awareness. Neha believes that being culturally aware will build understanding and trust across cultures and ignite creativity and innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Neha Washikar. When I was in elementary school, my mom forced me every day to read short stories to her in two Indian languages. I was six. I would much rather have been doing anything else than waste precious playtime reading short stories in foreign languages. It was basically worse than doing homework because I couldn't pull the classic, sorry, my dog ate my homework excuse because, well, the teacher was in my house and she knew I didn't have a dog. So what did I do to avoid my misery? I remember skimming through the entire book, picking out the shortest stories, and just reading those same five stories again and again. On top of that, if I had to read for, let's say, 10 minutes, I would just read those stories very, very slowly. Needless to say, this was not my favorite thing to do, and I drove my mom crazy. But now, years later, I proudly say I can speak six languages, have a diploma in Indian classical dance, and most importantly, talk to my extended family in India. Not just small talk, but I can really connect to them on a level I could not have if I did not know much about my culture. Growing up in the US, we're already exposed to American culture, whether it be through school, social media, extracurriculars, or friends. We grew up watching the 4th of July fireworks, going door to door, practically begging for candy on Halloween, and looking forward to every Super Bowl halftime show. But in a multicultural world like ours, we have the opportunity of being exposed to other cultures. Of course, staying connected to another culture will take more effort, but developing cultural awareness will ignite the light within you and ultimately society. I will be covering three main topics today. What is cultural awareness? What are its benefits? And how can we develop it? America, as we know, is the land of opportunities, making it a hub for immigrants and a melting pot for various ethnicities and cultures. Cultural awareness 
is much more than knowing just how people dress or what they eat. I like to think of culture as a tree, with the leaves being attributes that you can see, such as language, attire, celebrations, and behavior, and the roots being values, traditions, customs, and beliefs. Once you understand both the leaves and the roots of the culture tree, you have cultural awareness. But why is this important? I asked myself the same question years ago when sitting at my kitchen table reading those short stories. Why should someone go through the efforts of being and staying culturally aware? Well, years later, I know why. Cultural awareness ignites delight personally, professionally, and for society. I have known my friend since first grade. To protect her privacy, let's call her Michelle. Both of Michelle's parents were born and brought up in China and later immigrated to America just a couple years before she was born. Ever since first grade, Michelle would tell me about her occasional visits to China. While talking to her a couple weeks ago, I noticed a pattern in all of her stories. She would be extremely glad to be back home in California, not only because she missed her friends, but because she felt like a complete outsider the entire time she was there. As I wrote this speech, I reached out to her again to ask her a couple questions. She said that while she was decently fluent in Mandarin, she would have felt more at home if she knew more about her culture and her roots. Since her last visit to China, Michelle has been able to rediscover her roots and be, become more open-minded through taking an AP Chinese course in her school. Now, whenever she calls her family in China, she's able to better connect and better relate to them, which ultimately strengthens a sense of support and connection whenever she's around them. So obviously, there are personal benefits, such as developing a deeper connection with your family and friends, and having a wider social network. Those who are bicultural can often speak more than one language, and Past research has already shown the correlation between multilingualism and high cognitive power and emotional and social skills. But it turns out that a lot of other benefits stem from having different perspectives that are developed when being deeply grounded within two cultures that you identify with. These perspectives ignite creativity and innovation and influence the way we think and behave. Three researchers from Tel Aviv University in Israel, Northwestern University in the US, and INSEED in Europe recently conducted three studies on both bicultural and monocultural students. In the first study with the group of MBA students in Europe, they found out that biculturals were more fluent, flexible, and novel, which means that they generated a greater number of ideas that were more unique and more creative. In the second study with the group of MBA students in the US, they found out that biculturals had more patents for products and services than monocultural students. The researchers noted that the reason biculturals exhibited high creativity is because they had a high integrative complexity. In simple English, that means that their thought processes combine various different possibilities and perspectives for any given situation. Specifically, biculturals are able to view a situation from two different lenses, giving them a more holistic view on how to approach it. Their ability to think outside the box ignites creativity within them, which automatically sets them apart from others. This creativity carries through professionally as well. The three researchers from before conducted a third study, this time with a group of Israeli professionals working in the Silicon Valley. They found out that biculturalism led to, led to a higher promotion rate and a better managerial reputation. With businesses going global, it's crucial not to underestimate the effect that cultural differences may have. The reason is the Israeli professionals were so successful is because awareness of your own culture translates to cultural sensitivity, which again is increasingly important in a diversified workplace. Through cultural sensitivity, People are able to combat dealing with conflict and hierarchy through different perspectives. This results in an increased communication between coworkers and a greater compatibility within a team. But this is not only about the individual. 
cultural awareness can prevent cultural appropriation within society. Let's go back to the culture tree that I was talking about. Simply put, cultural appropriation is when people from one culture carefully and conveniently pluck the leaves off the culture tree of a different culture while completely disregarding the roots. An example of this happened last year with the recent production of The Lion King. Now I know what you're thinking. The Lion King has been a children's classic for the past quarter century. So what could have possibly arisen? Well, it turns out that Disney had trademarked one of the most popular phrases in the movie, Hakuna Matata, meaning no worries. However, this understandably outraged many Swahili speakers. How can a business trademark a part of a language, a part of a culture, just to make more profit? Such an outrage could have been avoided through cultural awareness and cultural sensitivity. If we want to ignite the light within society and bring everyone together, we have to start igniting the light through cultural awareness within ourselves, which brings me to my last point. How can we develop cultural awareness? The biggest thing that we can do at any age is to be observant of the different cultures, especially the ones around us. The issues that arise from not being culturally aware often stem from ignorance, and addressing that is well within our control. Everybody can start learning a language that they're interested in. Younger children can talk to their extended family about various traditional holidays and festivals. High school students and college students can take part in exchange programs to broaden their understanding about different countries and different cultures. In the workplace, professionals can celebrate holidays and festivals such as Diwali, Chinese New Year, Hanukkah, and more. However, it's important to do this carefully because if not done properly, cultural appreciation can quickly turn into cultural appropriation. To avoid this, we need to give due credit to the cultures that we're inspired by, while also being aware of their boundaries. So to conclude, if I could go back in time and tell my six-year-old self one thing, it would be to appreciate those short stories instead of challenging them. Because those short stories helped me embrace my culture, enhance my language, and ultimately brought me closer to myself. On a global level, Cultural awareness allows people to be more appreciative of each other's differences. Therefore, developing cultural awareness will ignite the light within you and ultimately society. Thank you. Thank you, Neha, for shedding light upon such an important topic. Now, I want all of you to close your eyes and imagine what our planet will look like a hundred years from now. Our next speaker is Shanlaya Tabafunda, and she'll be educating us more about climate change and the effect that psychology and our actions play on it. She'll tell us more about the ways in which we can help combat future damage to our planet. Please put your hands together for Shanlaya. Okay, listen, what if I somehow traveled backwards in time and I accidentally distracted my grandma from ever meeting my grandpa? Because then my dad wouldn't be born, right? And then I wouldn't even exist. A lot of us like to joke that if we had the ability to travel backwards in time, we'd be scared that a minor action we took then could massively impact our current lives. But we neglect to see that minor actions we take today could have a massive impact on the future. This idea of the butterfly effect works both positively and negatively. If we make small changes, they'll add up over time to benefit the future. But if we continue making poor decisions, their effects will snowball, ultimately causing our downfall. One example of the butterfly effect can be seen in the topic of climate change. Now, everybody already knows climate change is a problem, so why is nobody acting on it? We are constantly inundated with facts and statistics that don't motivate us to change very much. But by understanding the psychology behind our own actions, or lack thereof, we can be better motivated to make significant changes in our own lives by enforcing communities that normalize caring about climate change and supporting policies that directly fight the problems. 
The first problem and the first reason why we don't act in the face of climate change is that we don't view climate change itself as a real threat. TheClimateChat.org, a website guiding a larger discussion on the topic of climate change, has come up with the acronym PAIN to explain why. The P stands for personal. We tend to play this blame game, pinning problems on a particular person or group of people. When in reality, climate change isn't the direct result of a specific person. We are all responsible for the future of our Earth. The A stands for abrupt. We notice changes that happen abruptly, and climate change is more of a gradual threat, so it doesn't really set off the alarm bells in our heads. Even so, a study by F.C. Moore, assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis, found that we are actually growing accustomed to climate change, implying that we are even less likely to act the longer it goes on. The I stands for immoral. We share articles and videos that make us feel angry or sad, but climate change just doesn't evoke these emotions to the extent where we can truly grasp how terrible its effects are. Sure, polar bears are losing their habitats and biodiversity is decreasing, but what does that mean for humans? Regulations are being cut under the Trump administration, but what effect does that really have on our everyday lives? Even though some natural disasters linked to climate change have directly affected people, like Hurricane Katrina, a study by Howe in 2019 found that these events don't cause people's opinions of climate change to shift very much in the long term. The N stands for now, which is kind of similar to the A for abrupt. Let's start this one off with an example. We're all aware that average temperatures across the globe are hitting record highs. In Antarctica in February of this year, scientists reported the highest recorded temperature on the continent, 64.9 degrees Fahrenheit. That was warmer than Los Angeles on the same day. So we all know that you know, global temperatures are following an upward trend, but it's not like we receive government push notifications on our phones telling us the weather tomorrow is gonna be 120 degrees, so we gotta act fast. No, climate change is just happening too gradually. We don't perceive the temperature increases, let alone all the other effects of climate change, as a real threat to our everyday lives. We aren't seeing the devastating impacts right now, and so it's hard for us to process why we should change our behavior. And you know, even if we did receive government push notifications telling us the weather was going to be 120 degrees, it's not guaranteed that everybody would act. You've probably seen on the news people refusing to evacuate their homes even in the midst of a massive hurricane. In a Time article in 2018, Jeffrey Kluger states that humans have evolved to care more about immediate threats than those in the future. And so it's hard for us to wrap our heads around why we should make sacrifices now, like evacuating our homes, even if this will help prevent future disasters. Now, even if climate change did follow the acronym of PAIN, even if it were personal, abrupt, immoral, and happening now, there are still psychological barriers preventing us from changing our behavior. It's no secret that humans are primarily self-centered animals since this increased our ancestors' chances of survival. As a result, humans have a region of our brains called the medial prefrontal cortex, or the MPFC, that has to do with regulating self-centered emotions and behavior. If you went under an MRI and I asked you to think about yourself, your MPFC would light up with activity. A similar thing happens if I ask you to think about a close friend or a family member, although to a lesser extent. But if I ask you to think about a random stranger, like residents of a small town in Ohio, your MPFC would barely light up at all. Now here's the interesting bit. According to a study by behavioral neuroscientist Darjan Bo in 2009, when you think about your future self, five or 10 years into the future, your MPFC doesn't really light up at all. We don't recognize our future selves as ourselves. So our usual self-centered behavior in wanting to protect our own interests and our chances of survival doesn't really kick in for our future selves. And this way of thinking is significant when the threat to our survival is climate change. So now that we understand the processes behind why we are so slow to act, we can discuss two powerful yet realistic solutions. These solutions are centered around a group mentality rather than the individual. 
because in this way we can overcome the individual psychological barriers and instead work towards change as part of a group. The first solution is enforcing communities that normalize caring about climate change. We all exist as parts of communities, whether it's our friends, our classmates, our schools, our workplaces, the Bay Area, California, and the entire United States. And we are also part of online communities that might bridge continents. A study by Jackson in 2008 says that we are more likely to work towards a goal if we are part of a tight-knit community or a group of friends working towards the same goal. We can utilize this idea of group mentality to our advantage by holding fundraisers in clubs at school, participating in events like Bike to Work Days, and bringing food to book club meetings or family reunions in reusable containers rather than plastic. And when we normalize and encourage this type of behavior, people feel peer pressured in a good way to fit in. Going back to the idea of the butterfly effect, when we make small contributions, they will add up across communities and over time. The second solution is supporting policies that directly fight the problems. Many of you have probably heard that global warming is largely due to big corporations for reusing tons of carbon dioxide and releasing it into the air or using unnecessary amounts of water. And while this is true, it doesn't mean that while well, citizens' actions are completely useless if companies are doing all this terrible stuff anyways, instead, it means that we need to be fighting back and pushing Congress to support policies that regulate energy and water usage. Greta Thunberg is at the forefront of climate strikes and rallies across the globe. And while these help serve as a public image of unity against a common threat, you don't need to participate in a strike to have an impact. Multiple websites like the Environmental Defense Fund at edf.org offer specific petitions that you can sign and ways to contact your local representatives. Now, let's take a step back for a second to put all of this into perspective. If we each do our part in the fight against climate change by enforcing it in our individual communities and supporting policies that regulate corporations, we just might be able to subvert a slow and painful death for thousands and thousands of species. You may never get the opportunity to travel backwards in time to accidentally distract grandma from ever meeting grandpa, but you do have the opportunity to shift the entire fate of our planet. In the words of Ernest Hemingway, the earth is a fine place and worth fighting for, and the power to do so is in your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Shanlea, for bringing awareness to the psychology behind climate change. Many people see Silicon Valley as a high-end area full of technology and innovation. Shrutika Suresh Babu is here to give us a different perspective of life inside Silicon Valley. She will be talking about why technology is used as a double-edged sword and how we can break out of the bubble of Silicon Valley. Please put your hands together for Shrutika. What is the first thing you think about when you hear the phrase Silicon Valley? Our agriculture, right? All the oranges and grapes and almonds that we grow here? Of course not. It's technology. Here, we pretty much live in the backyard of Apple headquarters, and several huge companies are also located here, from Apple to Google to Tesla. Nowhere else in the country is the community so heavily impacted by technology. It's how our state has the fifth highest economy in the world. Isn't that mind-boggling? And this technology, which has the capabilities to connect people over thousands of miles, has put us inside somewhat of a bubble. We are distanced from the regions around us as our communities are vastly different. The rise of technology present in Silicon Valley has been able to benefit its residents greatly by increasing our economic growth as well as improving our education systems. 
but has also pushed people out of our cities due to high housing costs, as well as introduced a harmful competitive spirit in our schools. But to truly understand what is going on, we must start at the beginning, with the birth of the internet. In 1969, Leonard Kleinrock, a professor at UCLA, along with his student Charlie Klein, devised a way to send a transmission from their computer to one at Stanford's research center, thus launching the start of the internet. They revolutionized the meaning of technology as they were able to send information over long distances in a short amount of time. Suddenly, huge corporations from all across the nation started popping up in the Silicon Valley, and a mere seven years later, Apple had been founded right here in Cupertino, California. As these corporations started moving into the region, they brought in large sums of money into the state in order to fund their projects as well as the construction of their buildings. And this money is vital to the development of Silicon Valley. Almost immediately, entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs from all across the nation started moving into the region in order to benefit off of the technological boom of Silicon Valley. Thanks to these companies, our colleges got immense funding for their research and their projects. This money allowed our professors access to resources that we never would have been able to afford. And these resources allowed our students to enhance their learning capabilities. But it doesn't stop there. Even our public schools benefit off of being located right next to these huge corporations. For example, Lawson Middle School pretty much borders Apple headquarters and is now known as an Apple Distinguished School. This title is given to schools that are centers for academic excellence and leadership, as well as use Apple products in order to inspire student creativity and critical thinking. Now, although using iPads in school is a very controversial topic, these devices have been able to enhance the learning of the majority of the students in the school. According to state test scores, about 91% of students are proficient in math, and about 87% are proficient in reading. Now, no matter what your opinions are on the devices themselves, these statistics are astronomical and are way above the national average. It is clear that these devices have been able to enhance the learning of our students by providing resources that we never would have been able to afford. But technology is also able to change the environment in which our students must learn. If you ask any student in Silicon Valley what they are most concerned about, they're probably going to say something school related whether it be getting an A in an AP class, getting the 1600 on the SAT, or being able to juggle two sports, a seven class course load, and ACT classes after school. Crazy, right? Can you imagine taking so many activities and still being expected to sleep eight hours every night? No wonder our students are so sleep deprived. We joke about this as if it's normal, as if every 16-year-old has to deal with this kind of stress. But at the core of it, we see the real problem, competition. Now, don't get me wrong, competition is not all that bad. It can help you reach your potential and go above and beyond. It can push you out of your boundaries to try new things. But we also have to realize when things go too far and cross a line. An immense amount of competition can lead to students feeling unbalanced in their lives. They feel pressured to succeed in academic competitions as well as gain more knowledge, thus pushing away any other hobbies or interests they may have. They put everything on hold in order to focus on their academic pursuit, thus fostering an unhealthy obsession with perfection. Take Cupertino High School, for example. They have about 12 tech-based clubs and over 20 STEM clubs. Each club has about 5 to 10 officer positions, which is reasonable. 
but they also have over 30 students applying for these officer positions. That's over 400 students applying because they think that these positions will help them get ahead of the crowd. But compete with one another for officer positions, for internships, for summer programs. Who can volunteer at the most events? Who can join the most clubs? Who can take the most AP classes? Essentially, who can do the most without breaking? Now you may ask us, why exactly are we so competitive? Why is the nature of Silicon Valley pushing our students to extreme lengths in order to prove themselves? Maybe it's because our colleges has such small acceptance rates and you want to be that one person in your high school that gets in. Or maybe we need to compete in order to stay here because our housing costs are so high in the area. Or maybe it's because everyone around us is just as competitive. Silicon Valley is known to be talent rich, from people coming from across the nation in order to get jobs at the companies located here, and entrepreneurs moving to begin their startups. Due to the circle of wealth we have gained from these companies appearing in the Silicon Valley, we've also gained their driven mentality. It is in our nature to be competitive, but sometimes we forget that the people around us aren't always our opponents. They aren't always someone to compete with and compare ourselves to. And this lack of knowledge coupled with our competitive spirit can backfire on us without us even knowing. This type of competition can lead to several disorders from a severe fear of failure to panic attacks, to anxiety disorders, and even depression. With these side effects, we question whether or not this rise of technology present in Silicon Valley was ever truly beneficial. So how do we solve this problem? Where technology is able to benefit us by increasing our economic growth and improving our education systems, but also harm us by introducing a harmful competitive spirit in our schools. We have to realize that it is not the technology nor these corporations that are the problem here, but rather it is with our education systems themselves. We want to correlate the tech industry and its effects on our education systems without realizing that it is our education systems that provide for our students and their opportunities. The tech industry has such a big impact on Silicon Valley because it is the one that is providing and educating our students, thus impacting it the most. Technology is not the main reason for the success or the drawbacks of Silicon Valley, but rather a visceral display of the power of a well-funded education. The issue here is that the only reason why our public system and public schools are so well-funded is because of these tech corporations, which isn't the way it should be. We need to ignite the passion for education within ourselves and our government, as it is the moral responsibility of the government to provide our students with the education they deserve, with the opportunities they deserve and with the life that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you for that eye-opening speech, Shritika. Our next speaker is Sam Viranka. She is going to be talking about Generation Z and the opportunities that are presented to them. She is going to tell us more about how individuals should use these presented opportunities to make a positive impact on the communities around them. Please welcome Samvi. It's always a fascinating conversation with my parents when I hear that they got their first phone at the age of 24. I can never come to believe that they spent the first 24 years of their life 
without the most groundbreaking invention of the 21st century. Kids like me in Generation Z are introduced to technology at such a young age, and we are truly fortunate to get the modern and quicker way of the technology. Generation Z refers to anyone born after 1995 and before 2010, which eventually leads to the oldest members being barely out of their teen years. Fortunately, I am also part of the wonderful Generation Z. Father of the nation and the Messiah of nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhiji said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. Generation Z is taking Gandhiji's wisdom to heart, and their choices are reflecting it. We are a generation that has seen it all. Everything from dot-com boom to dot-com bubble burst. The devastating 9-11 event of 2001. The 2008 financial crash, and we're currently going through a tough pandemic situation. I am about to miss my eighth grade graduation and I will watch as my friends and family in high school miss their high school graduation, an even more important milestone as part of an academic journey. As recently as now, the pandemic got the best of us. I watched how my friends and family in high school transitioned from preparing for high school prom to setting up an online school account. I saw the SATs and the ACTs becoming optional. It shook us but we dusted it off and got ready to enter a whole new virtual world of online classes, meetings, and turning those flabs into abs. Our experiences from the past prepare us for anything to come in the future. Now all the generations before us did the best they could with the limited technology and innovation they had. They worked hard, remained loyal to their employer, and always made sure there was food on the table for their family. However, they always discussed how they could have done more, but were never able to put their plan into action. And this is why they see us as their hope of the future. We have responsibilities to fulfill, and that's why the baton has been passed to us. Ever heard of the quote, actions speak louder than words? Well, taking that into consideration, we as Generation Z can take our ideas and passions and actually put our plan into action. We can achieve things, things the generations before us were never able to achieve. We are fortunate enough to be in the midst of a digital and social media revolution. This entire experience gives us so many ideas that could be used towards helping a great cause. Today, by sharing my journey and my experience, I want all the young people out there to be able to take risks that would lead to an applause-worthy product and could potentially help save lives. As truly digital natives, we, as Generation Z, use social media not only to learn about important issues, but also to make a meaningful difference. 91% of our generation says that we use social media to learn about and participate in issues that we care about. We feel so well informed, in fact, that we know more about important issues than our parents or guardians. We sincerely feel like social media engagement can drive change. 80% of our generation says that using social media can really create an important impact on issues. About two to three years ago, Google published a magazine with the title, It's Lit. That's right, you heard me, It's Lit. My dad always says he trusts Google more than my mom because Google knows him better than my mom. And that's why I trust Google for data. Anyways, according to the magazine, Generation Z is the most informed, evolved, and empathetic generation of its kind. We value information and connection, evident by our affinity for YouTube, Netflix, and Facebook. Now, we as Generation Z can achieve and do so much. We like to be self-directed, as we know that the biggest change can be made only by what we envision. A recent study by the well-known Northeastern University said that as a group, Gen Z tends to be highly self-directed, demonstrated by a strong desire to work for themselves, 
study entrepreneurship and designed their own programs of study in college. As self-directed young individuals, we, as Generation Z, can take our opportunity and potential and make a change in the world for the better. We can achieve things, things that people before us were never able to achieve. Now adding my own personal experience into the mix. Belonging to an immigrant entrepreneur household, I grew up taking many risks and I grew up with many changes. I was fortunate enough to be blessed with a caring family and a great vocal talent. And honestly, life was pretty simple until reality hit. And I learned about my neighbor's daughter who had ASD, autism spectrum disorder. I noticed how the family's plans changed and I noticed how some things they thought they would be able to do, they weren't able to do anymore. At the time, I was young and I didn't understand much of it. Until recently, another family friend of mine was diagnosed with a rare case of autism called CDKL5. This time, I was much older and I understood the difficulties the family had to go through. I knew that there was not only an emotional drain upon them, but also a financial drain. I wanted to see what I could do to help, so I continued on to do some research on available CDC websites and I discovered that about one in six, around 17% of the children aged three to 17 were diagnosed with a developmental disability. In the year 2000, one in 150 children were diagnosed with autism. In the year 2008, one in 88 people were diagnosed with autism. And in the last year recorded by CDC, 2014, one in 59 people were diagnosed with autism. Now, if we put this into simple math, autism in the last three years grew 16-fold. Now, being part of Generation Z and not being afraid of making change, I was able to take these numbers and make a positive impact. I could have stopped here, knowing what the problem was, and just having someone else swoop in and solve the problem for me. But as Generation Z, we are here to make a difference. Now, I created this box that was a subscription toy box that was not only affordable but also educational and gave children the resources they needed to develop their sensory skills, motor skills, and communication skills. I wanted to make a positive impact on these children's lives one box at a time. Well, you must be asking, why did I create this box? Well, it was because when I went on to do some more research about these special children, I came to a shocking revelation. While any foreign e-commerce store sold a toy for a dollar or two, the same toy on a leading store in the United States was sold for tenfold the price. Similarly, a regular iPad case with a little extra protection was sold for $99 to $100 whereas the real price would be worth anywhere from five to six dollars. So to solve that problem, I created a subscription toy box for autistic children. Now, I have the same access to the digital world as anyone in Generation Z does. We are the digital first generation. For me to solve a problem and find a solution, all I needed to do was research online using digital tools such as Google, CDC reports, Facebook groups, and just talking to the parents in the vicinity. Technology is not just changing Generation Z. It is increasing connectivity and changing the way Gen Zers perceive themselves. I have the same access to the digital world as anyone in Generation Z does. With the available digital resources and with the help of family and friends, if I could take a step towards making a positive impact, all of us together as Generation Z can make an even larger impact. So together, let's make the world a better place, one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that speech with us, Sanvi. How many of you have received emails or messages trying to steal your personal information? 
probably everyone that is watching this TEDx talk. Our last speaker for today is Anirudh Suresh. He will be talking about the potential vulnerability of using social media and how we can protect ourselves from being a victim of cybercrime. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anirudh. In 2013, Apple released iOS 7 for all of their phones and devices, and the launch went relatively smoothly, except for the fact that a fake ad campaign was started on how the new update now made your phones waterproof. The ad said that the new update could detect when your phone was in contact with water and then disconnect and disable all the electronic components inside of your phone, essentially making it immune. Now, this, of course, was a blatant lie made up by the internet to try and trick a few users, and people fell for it, dunking their phones in water and causing thousands of dollars of damage. And it just sucks that Apple's warranty doesn't cover any water damages. Then, about a year later in 2014, iOS 8 rolled out, and the exact same thing happened. Except this time, instead of a trial by water, it was a trial by fire with the new Wave advertisement. The basic gist of it was that your phone's radio frequency transmitter could detect microwaves and then direct them towards the battery in the phone. Essentially, you could just pop your phone in the microwave for a few minutes and charge it up. Now, please be insured, your, your phone definitely can't do this. And while we know that now, that didn't stop the dozens of users who set their phones and their microwaves on fire and posed such a hazard to themselves that the authorities had to get involved to stop it. Now, there were numerous other ads like this created to try to get people to destroying their phones, some more effective than others, but at the end of the day, we could see that none of these were really out of pure malicious intent. Now, sure, many people call these jokes going way too far, and I wholeheartedly agree with them, but at the end, all that was lost were a few phones and maybe a little bit of self-respect. Now, I wouldn't be too hasty to blame these people that fell for it either. I mean, these advertisements were specifically designed to imitate apples. And with it just being posted and reposted all across the internet and on social media, some people genuinely thought that these were legitimate. You see, all of this stems from a very basic weakness in a system, and that is humans. Humans are susceptible to manipulation. It's been that way all throughout history especially with modern technologies bringing communications between us to the level that they are right now, and with the internet, a brand new front has opened on taking advantage of the masses, and that is social media. The United States Securities and Exchange Commission says that Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn have all become key tools, and that, quote, fraudsters can use social media in their efforts to appear legitimate to hide behind anonymity, and to reach as many people as possible at a low cost. You see, these people online, they try to imitate someone you trust, a friend, a coworker, your bank, anything to get you to drop your guard so that they can fish exploitable information out of you. This method, aptly named phishing, is prevalent everywhere on social media, and it tries to prey on either your greed, your curiosity, or just simply your inattentiveness so that you can get played into giving the perpetrator whatever they want. Now, we all know about the dangers of using the internet, right? I mean, most of us do. But just knowing about the problem and a lack of genuine action towards solving it leads to complacency and ignorance of it. You see, you, you can have all your antivirus software and your malware protection. You can have all the safety in the world to just forget about the problem. But the human factor will always be the weakest link in the chain and these people know that. Perpetrators online specifically target the human user using social engineering in order to take advantage of them. And again, many of us can see this coming from a mile away. We know about the problem, but just the sheer scale of how often this happens wears us down to eventually where someone gets caught. And someone will get caught. You see, the Federal Trade Commission's Consumer Sentinel Network found that in 2018, there was a 38% increase in the amount of monetary reported losses to fraud. The leading methods were imposter scams and identity theft, things that are done through phishing. Now, there were different methods of delivery, but social media was by far one of the most used. And you might be thinking that 
the elderly or the children might be the easiest targets, but the truth is that young, adult, young adults were the ones that fell for it the most. The FTC actually emphasized that about 43% of all the reports by people between the ages of 20 and 30 had reported losses, the highest of any other demographic. These are your young adults going straight into the modern workforce. These are your entrepreneurs coming out of college. These are your brand new parents and so on. Arguably the most influential demographic on the planet gets taken advantage of the most. And for demographics that aren't as generally savvy with online tools, such as say the elderly, well, the situation gets a lot worse. Now, there are fewer reports from them in general, but that can simply be attributed to the fact that the elderly use online tools at a much lower rate than the rest of us. The few of them that do use it, however, fall for these kinds of ploys much harder. There is an 87.55% increase in the median value of losses encountered by those between the ages of 70 and 80. And if you go to people above the age of 80, that jumps up to over four times the median amount of loss. Now, these were all numbers that we got from 2018. There were 1.4 million total reports. In 2019, that jumped up to 3.2 million. Once again, imposter scams were the highest reported scam. And for now, we just need to look at the fact that $667 million were lost to just that. Now, please keep in mind that these are only the reported values. Estimates show that there are numerous people out there who are just far too embarrassed to report their victimization. But there are people out there who are being victimized. So these numbers that I presented, they're not even the full picture. And the picture gets a lot worse. In 2020, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission found that $36 million were lost in just Australia alone to these kinds of things within the first three months and hundreds of millions more in the, year, in the rest of the world. Now, the depravity of how people get affected gets so much darker. Now, these numbers that I showed you, they're so bad just because of the sheer scale of how, how often this kind of thing happens. You see, there are tens of billions of messages, posts, links, advertisements, emails, and accounts created and sent every single day. And you can have your spam filters and your Facebook settings, you can have your private accounts and your push notifications and whatever other safety in the world, but some of these will still get through. And when the machine can't detect it, it falls on the human user, the weakest link in the chain, to control what happens next. But things do turn, to, things do get much, much darker. In rural parts of Africa, where things like getting a stable internet connection or a reliable source of information is slightly harder to come by, misinformation spreads like wildfire on their social media infrastructure. Now, it's, it's in human nature to gossip, to tell stories, all because we evolved that way as a safety mechanism. Instead of saying, don't go into the lake, it's not safe there, we instead would tell a story on how someone from the tribe got eaten by an alligator, and it would convey the danger of the lake in a much more meaningful way. Well, during the Ebola outbreak in, in Africa, there was news spreading about how the government was persecuting people of certain ethnicities, or about how the testing kits were meant to poison and kill and spread the disease, things that just weren't true. And in fact, it got so bad that Mr. Nguyen, the information management coordinator for the Red Cross, said that, quote, there's an extensive phone network in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and people are using WhatsApp. There are whole groups just dedicated to talking about Ebola. He goes on to say that if you're the fifth person in a chain or the 50th, it's just not easy to check your sources. And the effects of this are deadly. People would outright refuse testing and treatment. And then once the government started enforcing it, people would refuse to give out the names of their family members or people they were in contact with or other information vital to stopping the spread of this deadly disease. Thousands of people died. And it's like we haven't even learned our lesson because the exact same thing is happening right now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the implications it has on our world health is a genuinely frightening thought. It's not just something that we can put an end to because there's no one bad guy we can point the finger at. It's all of us who take part inside of this that are guilty of it. But that was a fairly extreme example but this kind of thing happens everywhere, every single day, ranging from politics to celebrities, all because people don't check what's really true, even when they do have the resources to do so. 
quickly, gossip like this just spirals out of hand and out of control and has very real consequences. What should be a 10 second fact check to realize when something just isn't true gets completely overshadowed by this massive mob mentality of people believing whatever they see at face value and then perpetuating whatever it is to all those around them, sometimes even basing actions on it. A tweet, a post, a protest, anything that can have real consequences. And it's not just something we can eliminate overnight. Once again, it's been so ingrained in our society, we've been doing it for so long and we're all guilty of it that it's gonna take a long time and a lot of effort on all of our parts to truly solve this problem. But there is some good news. There is a ray of hope. That's that we're not at the dystopian worst case scenario just yet. It's extremely easy for someone like you or I to overcome any of these things. You just need to ignore, avoid, or verify any of these things that I mentioned and you'll essentially stay safe. Chances are you've probably come across some of these things but the hard part is always being vigilant. Now, somewhat ironically, there are, plenty of, there are plenty of resources out there on the internet in order to help you increase your awareness. And a large majority of people are able to navigate a large majority of problems that come their way. But still, far too many have fallen for these kinds of ploys. Now, we're teaching kids in schools about how to use online tools safely. We've been hammering it home over the news coverage, but none of that's still enough. Otherwise, the number of victims wouldn't be increasing as rapidly as it is right now. You see, we know about the problem. We've known about it for a long time, but it always ends up fading back into obscurity until another big scare, scandal, or security breach brings it back into the spotlight. The only way to truly stay safe all the time is to be alert, be up to date and be educated. Be smart about the things that you and those around you do online. And if there's just one thing that you can leave with today, let it be this. You are more than capable of avoiding these subterfuges. Tech giants and independents have stepped up to the plate to create easily accessible resources all for the public to utilize for free. There are thousands of articles and resources being created and published every single day. And maybe if we as a whole brought this problem off of the back burner and into the limelight, we'd see some true improvement. But the sad reality is with the global climate right now, especially with the pandemic, things are gonna get a lot worse before they get any better. But hopefully with the plentiful tools out there, us and those around us can navigate this social media minefield just a little more safely. Thank you. Thank you for bringing awareness to such an important topic, Anirud. As we are nearing the end of our event today, we would like to thank all of our speakers for inspiring us in so many different ways. Each speaker brought new ideas and perspectives to the table, and we are so glad that we got to learn so much. Additionally, we would like to thank all of you viewers for tuning in and listening today. Furthermore, this event would not be possible without the help, dedication, and support from the Recreation Coordinator, Mr. Danny Mestizo, and the Teen Services Librarian, Mr. Matt Lorenzo. Lastly, thank you all again for attending TEDx Youth at Torrey Avenue 2020. As TEDx Youth at Torrey Avenue 2020 comes to a close, we wanted to acknowledge our amazing team that has been working nonstop behind the scenes to make this event possible. Working since January 2020, our team greatly appreciates all the support and love that we are receiving from our wonderful Cupertino community. We would like to give out a special thank you from our team, from the Cupertino Library's Teen Advisory Board and the City of Cupertino's Teen Commission. To our sponsors, the Cupertino Library, the Friends of the Cupertino Library, and the City of Cupertino. Our event coordinators, Mr. Matt Lorenzo and Mr. Danny Mestizo. And our wonderful five speakers. We wanted to say a huge thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For joining us here tonight. On behalf of our whole team. We hope you all enjoyed our show this year. And are staying safe during these unprecedented times. We wish you all wonderful health, and we hope to see you all next year for TEDx Youth Auditorium Avenue 2021.